Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the next segment on the Quantum Leap business show going 24 hours non-stop around the world uh, today and then for recording like Netflix catch up uh, afterwards. It's my great pleasure to have on the program uh, today the founder of a very well-known uh, brand. Uh, so it's an absolute pleasure uh, to have Joe Foster on the show today, the founder of Reebok. Good afternoon, Joe. Good afternoon, John. Thank you for the invitation. I uh, trust all's going well in uh, sunny France, as I believe that you are at the moment. It's not too bad. They've just released us from total lockdown. <laughs> but we, we still have curfew at seven o'clock at night, so we can't really go out anywhere. <clears throat> and whilst the sun is shining most of the time, the wind is cold at the moment. Yes, but, yeah, uh, same, same yeah. here in the UK. So uh, you, you and Julie won't be out clubbing and then uh, for a little while yet? Not yet, no, if ever. <laughs> <laughs> so Joe, let's uh, let's crack on. Um, I appreciate your time today and I'm sure everybody else will. So one of the agonies for a lot of business owners when they very first start their business or uh, want to take that next step is is what do I call my business? I remember one time I was uh, we, we got together with three other people and we were putting together a company. We we're merging a couple of companies. What do we call the new entity? And it took us like three days to, to discuss the uh, name before we came up with the plan, which seems uh, really funny. But what inspired you to come up with the name Reebok? And what difference if you would use the English spelling of the word? Yeah, well, it, uh, I mean, really, the story starts a long way back. It starts with my grandfather because he, he had his company, J.W. Foster, which is my name, J.W. Foster. And uh, he was quite a genius. He built his company, it died in 1933, uh, 15 months before I was born in 1935. Um, of course, I didn't join the company until I was 17, which was the J.D. with Foster Company. And at 17, I had 12 months in the company, and uh, only 12 months because then we had to go for two years of national service. And my brother, Jeff, he also went at the same time. He was older than me, but because of deferment, we both went at the same time. So. 1953, we both leave the J.W. Foster Company and go off and do national service. Um, Jeff went to Germany, and he's looking at companies like Adidas, Puma. He's seen different than what we're doing, J.W. Foster. Uh, two years later, 1955, we both come back, and we come back to a company. I mean, we'd had two years away. Mother wasn't making your breakfast or washing your clothes or looking after you. You know, it was like, oh, just a minute, you know. We've learned how to be self-sufficient. We come back and we, well, we don't need it. And we're looking at a company. And it's a failing company. J.W. Foster's and Sons Athletic Shoes were failing because father and uncle had taken over the business from 1933. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know what it is, whether you know, two world wars or what, but they just didn't seem to see that this was a company that needs, needs attention. You know, you need to keep a company going. We tried. We tried our best to get them to say, look, come on, move it on. But unfortunately, Father Bill, Father Jim and Uncle Bill, they're feuded. They were, they were just more fighting. Each other. I think it was six years between them, but for whatever, there was something else that uh, was there. And a bit like Addy Dassler and uh, Rudy Dassler, you know, they couldn't get on together, but Rudy left and set up Puma, fine. But uh, Bill and Jim, you no, know, they just stuck together feuding. Yep. Uh, well, how do you change that? Well, we couldn't. We tried, and um, we tried for, well, it was three years before we eventually left the company. But we knew before then we had to. So we'd done a bit of college work. We'd learned a bit more about shoemaking. I was against just making athletic shoes at J.M. Foster's. Yep. So when we left, um, we knew what to do. Okay, so when you leave, you leave the company, J.M. Foster, and this is the question, how do you choose a name? Well, we couldn't was J.W. Foster. There was already a J.W. Foster. That would be very difficult. So uh, it didn't take real long. And uh, I think I came up with the with Mercury because Mercury, Quicksilver, fast, whatever, yep. sounds good. And we had the winged messenger uh, as, as our logo. Fantastic. Great. OK, we're off into business. We're like that. And uh, 18 months down the road, our accountant said, well, guys, you know, you're making a bit of money. You're doing all right. People like your shoes, um, you better register that name. Uh, you know, 
Jeff and I were still young at that time. What do you mean, register your name? Uh, well, if somebody else starts making under the name Mercury, um, you might have trouble. And certainly you're going to have to go to court or fight it, it's going to cost you money. So you better register it. All right. So we try to register it. Fight. Oh, oh look, somebody else has registered his name. Uh, it was a part of British Shoe Corporation, I think Lotus and Delta at the time. Uh, they, weren't, they weren't using it. Yep. And uh, so we got an agent and the agent had a word with them. Yes, they'd sell it to us for a thousand pounds. Well, you know. <laughs> Back in the 50s, that had been a fair, <laughs> fair amount of money. That would be a very much, and, and you know, we only just started really in business and we, we had no money at all. So uh, he said, but you can, uh, you can apply to the court and you know, ask her, how much will that cost? He said about a thousand pounds. Okay, uh, well, we can't do that. So he said, well, you've got to get a new name. And I, I think it was, it was in May and he pointed through the window. It was a nice day, he had his window open in the middle of Manchester and pointed to the sign Kodak. Oh, yeah, Kodak. So what's with Kodak, I, I asked. And uh, <clears throat> he said, well, means nothing. They made it up. Yep. That sort of name you can register, dead easy. No problem. Oh, okay. He said, but uh, bring me at least 10 names. I said, just a minute, what, what do you mean bring you 10 names? Um, why? And uh, he said, well, we've got to put this through the register. And as you know, with Mercury, <laughs> it may, they may not come out clear. You may yeah. have problems trying to get that. Yeah. So I go back, we sit around the table, we go through these names, we come out with names like Cougar, Falcon, things. No, we can't, we can't think of devising a name. It's like, how do you do that? <laughs> anyway, I'm going to take it to 1943, middle of World War II. And we, nobody's on holiday. You stay at home holidays, you said those. And they had athletics meetings. And I'm entered into a 60 yard race and I win. Fantastic. I had a bit of an advantage though, because with Foster's, I was wearing spike shoes. Yep. Nobody else wore spike shoes in those days. So maybe it was a bit of an advantage in winning. Okay. I go up, track my prize. Oh, yes. What do I get? A dictionary. <laughs> I'm eight years old, and somebody gives me a dictionary. Oh, I'm so annoyed. You know, what are the nice toys? What are the things <laughs> I can play with? The dictionary. However, and it was American dictionary. Yeah. I didn't know at the time. It was a Webster's American dictionary. Okay, I'm back now. We're back to 1960, and we're, we're, we're looking for names, and I, I have my dictionary there, and I open the dictionary, and I'm looking for I like that letter R. I thought that's a strong start to anything, R. So uh, turn to R, start leafing through from R. Not long before you get to R E and R double E, B or K. Oh, what's that? Oh, small South African gazelle. Gazelle. Oh, right. Sounds perfect. Top of the list. Yep. Back to the agent. Test these, but don't care what you do. We want that one. We want Reebok. Reebok, we have to be in love with it. It has to be our emotion. Yeah, we, we can't be doing with many of these other, but that one we love. As it happened, it was the only one that came out that we could use. Yep. But one, one caveat that the, uh, that the uh, registrar said, well, we're going to put you in part B of the register. I mean, I thought a register was a register. <laughs> yep. Part B. What's part B? Well, they said, if anybody comes up uh, and comes to us and say, we're making, we're making shoes, running shoes or any shoes out of Reebok leather, we can't stop them. You can't stop them because it's Reebok leather. All right. And Jeff and I looked at each other and thought, what's the chance of that? Yeah. Nobody's, nobody's going to think of that one. Yeah. We'll go with Reebok. So we're with Reebok in part. 20 years later, the registrar comes back and says, we've moved you to part A. So because now most people know that this, or everybody knows now, this is a shoe. This is a running shoe. It yep. is an animal. So that's how we got Reebok. Wow. So uh, it's strange how a, 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 a sequence of events took place in order to, uh, to come up uh, with the name. So, and, and a very fitting one as it, uh, as it is. So I speak, uh, as you know, Joe, about around the world on business and what have you. And, and one of the topics is starting with the end in mind, taking Stephen Covey's uh, philosophy. And 
starting with the end in mind, do you agree with that philosophy? Because, you know, you started from a third generation shoe shop that was just in Bolton to all of a sudden having ideas of being a global brand. And that just doesn't happen accidentally. So what are your thoughts on uh, that philosophy? Well, I mean, this is fairly new business philosophy. This is, this is a fairly new thinking. You know, people now think in business terms and it, it's, you know, you've got to have a way out or what's the finish, where you start here. You know, in those days, for Jeff and myself, it was a means of earning a living. We, we, we were in a family that made running shoes and had, had a history, but who knew? Nobody knew. That history wasn't important in those days to anybody else. Uh, to us, it was a job. Yep. And we knew it was failing. So our philosophy at that time was, let's get a job. And yep. thing, there's nobody else around here making money shoes. We'll have to set up our own business. So that was it. So we started with the uh, with the notion that, uh, right, you know, this is a living. But, you know, as, as we progressed, uh, it grew into a bit of a passion. You know, we, uh, um, we started to recognise that our grandfather was a bit of a genius. And, that, you know, that... Yeah, he, he did something, he did something different. And we were, con you know, we were carrying on with this. Um, but uh, yeah, if, if you look back like sporting prowess uh, as an influence, really in those days to build a brand uh, beyond being other sports performers just didn't exist. And really it wasn't until, I think after World War II, till we, we were just started when a brand that became something with influence and sports brands, we started to hear of Adidas and Puma. You know, we were in that. So at that point, because that time, you weren't just influencing other performers. You weren't, if you were making football boots, just not people who wore football boots who were starting to push, to influence, it was the street. Yep. That is selling replica shirts. So at that time, I think at that time, we, we recognised the value of our brand. Um, and we owned it. We didn't have any change of mind, though, because... We then wanted to replicate what grandfather had done and build this in, into a brand and where could we take it? Yep. So this one's a question of an exit plan. <laughs> this is a question of let's build something. So, so which uh, lends itself into a follow-up question to that is that if uh, you know, you've had a long and distinguished career and very successful that most people would envy, but if you had, your, if you're starting the brand again today, what would you increase, decrease or change from what you did 50, 60 years ago. Now with, we've got modern technology, we've got internet, we've got everything else available to us now. Well, I, I think now is for now. And, and I think what we did, um, you know, we, we had the passion to build a brand um, and, and we wanted to build it into something that would be, well, I suppose really to begin with, that we recognized, <laughs> you know, and we built it with athletes. And, and sort of, it, it, it took a while we, you know, we, we grew and we valued our name. And this, again, wasn't a question of um, how do you get out? When do you get out and why? I mean, uh -huh. I did get out. And the reason was that I think I had reached um, probably not the end of my career, but I thought that you need other people. You know, you need me because when I got out, and that was the end of 89, um, you know, we had a bunch of accountants, a bunch of lawyers, and a bunch of people who were more, more used to the grocery trade, selling boxes and, you know, we were doing five million pairs a month. Yep. Yeah, I, w I was on an airplane. Then I'd, I'd put on another 30 countries after doing America, and, and I got then on another 30 countries. So I was going around the world. And, and then I, it was a matter of, okay, you're flying to wherever, you, you picked up by a limousine, you go to the best hotel, you go out, you dine at the best restaurants and you talk about business, but the, where's the challenge? So yep. for me, for me I, I thought, for me, the challenge had gone, you know, it was time to step back. Other people need now to take this on. Yeah, I, I can begin it and take it there. And maybe that's my thinking of how do you get out? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, but it was more of when do you get out? Not, not getting out of the company, it was stepping back. Yeah. You know, whoops. Because I did step back from the company and, uh, and yet the company, it's a bit like the Eagles and Hotel California. You can check out, but you can never leave. Yes. <laughs> and it was a bit like that. So yeah. really I've never left the company. And, and even now I'm, I'm quite close. And you know, well, well, now with the uh, opportunity that I did just to sell in the company so it could become an independent company again. 
So I think it was an exciting time ahead. So yes, I moved back and out, but no, that wasn't wasn't in, in our thinking. It's like yep. the word the word entrepreneur. In 1958, I don't think we'd heard of it. Yep. I, if it had been created in those days, and there are many words, and like you were saying, technology today. Yes, this is where it's at. Technology. A lot of people struggle, I think, Joe. You know, they've started up their own business and it's become a lifestyle business, as perhaps yours was in the very early days with your brother. And then all of a sudden, you you know, you hit a little point and you think, hmm, this is going somewhere. In today's parlance, that'd be probably somewhere around £100,000 of turnover. And then all of a sudden, from Struggle City, you're starting to have to recruit people and take that next step. And then all of a sudden, there's another little conveyor belt, perhaps around a million pounds in turnover today, when you start scaling a business and, and move to multiple locations. Do you think any of that has changed in, uh, in your time? Well, I, I, I think everything's changed. You know, I mean, now you can get yourself an MBA, you can learn all about business and, and you can learn all these steps and people do take these steps. And I, and I guess that what may be different is anybody who does take different steps might be the ones who succeed these days because you know, there are patterns growing there. <clears throat> um, so, I mean, in those days, as we grew, we, we, we knew we were developing a culture uh, because we, we were more embracing people. Uh, and we love people people who we, st who we knew, who we met during our journey, people who were, became part, as again saying, oh no, we need an accountant or we need, we need someone to handle this, let's put an advert in and let's interview. I, I think if I interviewed two people in my, in my time, that was about it. Yep. Yeah, we, <clears throat> this wasn't finding people. I think on, on occasions we used, we used an agency once to get somebody, and I think that was more for something like an accountancy role than anything else. But we, we grew sort of organically, you know, people, there were always people around us. You know, we, we were involved in the business. In a lot of footwork companies just made shoes and yep. then made football boots and they made these things and then this, they had agents to sell them. We were very much involved. Jeff himself was a, a good cyclist and a good athlete. He, he tried too hard. Jeff really tried too hard, and uh, he was always he was always physically sick at the end of an event because he'd gone over, you know, <clears throat> giving it everything. And and unfortunately, that and that was I think that was the cause <clears throat> of the stomach cancer that he died of. <clears throat> and unfortunately, he died of that just when we got into America. Yep. He didn't see the benefits. He didn't see the growth. <clears throat> he'd gone through the struggle for 10, 15 years, but didn't get there for that time. But we were involved with athletes. So for me, it's, it is a question of the involvement and everybody came into this culture and we developed a winning culture. Yeah, so everybody was, well, and it's like, I mean, today we get these statements, if you, you know, if you're the brightest person in the room, we're in the wrong room. Yep. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> those sort of things, all those things. Well, it was bringing people in with some good ideas, better ideas, yeah. And my thought on that one was that if, you know, you need to bring somebody in who can do the job better than you can. And, yep. and, and that way you're going to benefit. Because if you think you can do it better, you're forever. And this is one of the problems Jeff had in the factory. <laughs> he had the people working machines. And if he didn't like the way they were working, he said, come on, I'll get off. I'll work this way. He could do it better. <laughs> yep. And I used to say to him, look, Jeff, we employ these people to, to work the machine. You know, if they can't do it, get somebody else. Yep. Don't you jump on the machine. But uh, <clears throat> so the, the philosophy really was, uh, and, 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 you know, making a lot of friends. During my time growing, I, I was making friends with lots of people in, in the same business where, because we were going, going the same road. You know, this was the same road. Have you any advice? You know, a lot of people were not my competitors. A lot of my, the, the people were, were working like me. Let's, let's find an answer to life. You know, let's go forward. Yep. Interesting. And, uh, and I'm sure a lot of people uh, can resonate that. I'll tell you what, uh, Joe, I had a very interesting read of uh, this little gem that, uh, that uh, you've uh, put out, The Shoemaker, uh, yep. as a book. And it was, uh, was a, a very interesting thing. And one of the things that caught my eye in the whole thing, it says uh, you, that you didn't like running and that you're a lousy shoemaker. 
and that, and that sounds at odds with most people who've started a business that would have made running shoes. Can you share that story briefly? Oh, well, I, I can really, because uh, running, I, I was good at sprinting. I, I won my dictionary. <laughs> so I was fast and quick. But uh, to me, uh, distance running, that was very painful. That was like, uh, and I, I didn't mind going out training, which, you know, I'd run four or five miles, but that was good thinking time, not competitive time. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. When you're out there running, you, you, you just, in fact, sometimes you can run and you can get back, uh, back home and think, oh, where did I go? Yep. Because your mind is just gone and it's good thinking time. But as far as running was concerned, no, to me, that was more stressful. I, I preferred a game where you had to work things out, think about things. I, and I played badminton. I played badminton at a reasonable level. In fact, uh, if you read the book, of course, I spent most of my national service <laughs> playing badminton, yep. which was very interesting and, <laughs> and, and quite a diversion from actually doing what uh, I was supposed to be doing. But uh, so, yes, so when it came to running, mm, no. A bit of a sprint, a bit of fat, okay. But then when it came to making shoes, and yeah, I could make shoes, but you know, when you stand there with a, a cobbler's last and you're making shoes and this is great, this is fine. But you know, you make one shoe at a time. That's, that's not gonna make you a lot of money. That's not gonna take you very far. You have to let somebody else make the shoes. So I decided that patience wise and uh, the fact that you know, I wasn't built for just making shoes, that I'd be a rock shoemaker. So, and you know, marketing, Jeff loves shoemaking. He, he loved running the factory, but you know, it was a marketing, designing, marketing, and then growing the brand. You know, yep. okay. so that was my attraction. So that, that's where I went to, instead of shoemaking. And uh, I, I guess I designed a good few shoes, but uh, Jeff was the one who, who created them. Great, uh, great point, and uh, one that for all people out there that have a partner of some kind in the business is uh, is a very uh, important uh, important point. Joe, you've used brand ambassadors and uh, to build your brand, and I know I've used uh, some as well. What are the pros and cons, and how do you find a suitable person for anybody out there looking for a brand ambassador? Uh, people like Angel Martinez, in your case. <laughs> Well, I, I hope, or Angel, as you call it, he, he, wasn't a, he wasn't an athlete that you would, um, you would sponsor, but he was an athlete who, who, who wanted more than he could achieve, as a lot of us do, a lot in athletes. And, and what, he, what he did, he became actually a technical rep for, for Reebok. So being a tech rep for Reebok, and he was in Los Angeles, you know, and and that, that is different from ambassadors. Ambas brand ambassadors, well, I think they are the bedrock for developing a brand. Absolutely. You, know, you need influence. But as we said earlier on, influencers only influence other people playing the game. Now influencers in, in whatever, they're, they're now so important to brand. So you get the right people. And, and I guess it, it a lot depends upon, we'll say if you're in sport, yes, taking on a... a top footballer, top athlete. Yeah, these people are people that they're looked up to. They, oh yes, he's wearing Reebok. He's wearing whatever brand. Now, but that's been going for a long time. Yep. As I said earlier, that's been going since after World War II. And, you know, it, but after World War II, we didn't have to pay them. <laughs> now, the, the downside of that is that this is a big expense. Yep. Whether you, whether you influence a team or people, this is a big cost. And now your know, influence has become a, a I'd say it's, it's almost a trade to be in because now you can be an influencer without anything, rap, music, you, and there are so many influencers. You, you look, I, I look on the internet and see Ariana Grande, she takes a photograph and she's got four or five million people. Yep. <laughs> well, well, yeah, Kim Kardashian has become a billionaire recently. That's right. And, and yeah. so, it's just amazing how that's changed. So, that, but now I, we, we are looking at sports brands and we have done since say, World War II, but now, now they're fashion brands. You know, uh, the brand has gone over the street and to be successful, you need influencers to get you onto the street and to grow. And as I say, Reebok was about 4 billion uh, when, when I left. 
But I mean, now we look at Nike and we look at uh, Adidas. I think Nike are well over 20 billion and Adidas are approaching 20 billion. So I'm, yeah, this is the growth, but this is street. Th these are not all performing. <laughs> yep. But it's the performance that influences. So yep. yes, but coming back to Arto, Arto, for me, he was a bit of magic. I mean, what he saw, what he saw with the aerobics was something different. Um, and it was his wife really who was really in, coming back after doing the aerobics with her mates and they were full of it. And I would say, what's all this about? And she said, oh, these are aerobic classes. And he said, what's aerobic? And he said, well, it's, it's where the, we're actually exercising to music. Yep. Oh, brilliant. Fantastic. Exercising to music, yeah. Arnold decided to go down and have a look at that. And of course, he saw the instructor in, in trainers. He saw half the class in trainers and the other half just in bare feet. And he thought, why don't we, why don't we make a nice soft glove leather upper, which would be really central and a nice cushioned sole with that name Reebokka. Because in those days, we were growing nicely in America in running, but we were only known in running and we were quite small by comparison to Adidas and, and Nike in those days, because Nike had suddenly grown. Um, and they were known to be male and sweaty. Yep. Yep. All of a sudden we were supplying this shoe and it was women. Yep. That was it. And, you know, the girls in LA, they were, the, these shoes were made out of glove leather, and that, that, I nearly fainted when somebody told me of glove leather, <laughs> because they were ripping away, they were just tearing away, and uh, after about six weeks, this fell apart. In the UK, in a lot of countries in this world, you would have been dead with that, that yep. would have been it. Yep. And not in America, not in LA, this went out and bought another pair of shoes. Yep. And, was, and when you get Jane Fonda buying a pair of shoes and using them in, in her workouts, well, it just went straight. All yep. of a sudden, the whole thing went straight. And that was the explosion for Reebok. Yep. But that's, that, that was our hill. And that's, that's how we came into the business. Interesting on how you've, you've taken a core product and found another niche for it. And, uh, and not by accident, because, you know, if you hadn't employed your brand ambassador, you wouldn't have come across the opportunity. So, and again, another great example of surrounding yourself with great people, because great people will bring new ideas to the table that, you know, would never have uh, occurred to you. So uh, what a great point. Joe, the, the shoe game must be as competitive as just about any other uh, profession, occupation, or brand, or whatnot around the world. How do you deal with competitors? And you know, what were some strategies there that if if uh, anybody out there had an issue with uh, trying to stand a little bit above uh, the people that are competing in their space, what would be one piece of advice that you'd share? Well, I think for us, we didn't we we didn't sort of look at our competitors as this is a challenge. You know, it it, it wasn't how to. Uh, it was really. What was the best? You know, where could we go? Not to better the competition, but, you know, what would be the best? This, you know, ignore the competition. You've got to look around and, and find something. Okay, it doesn't mean to say you don't know what the opposition's doing. You do. You've really got to know what your opposition up to because they, they can be leading the trend. And then you've got to look at the trend and say, how did they get there? And so it wasn't really a competition. I think it was, how do we, how do we grow? How do we get there? And... And, and, I, and I think, again, that is all to do with being involved with athletes. So you know, we, we talk about uh, people who can help your brand grow, your influencers, and we are talking about athletes who actually can help with product. And quite a few of our athletes, you know, we had Ron Hill. Ron Hill was one of the best athletes in the UK uh, in marathon running for many years. You know, he was our leading marathon runner. In fact, he won the Boston Marathon in record time. And I think that was down somewhere like 1968, 69. He runs in record time. And he helped us develop a, a, one of our shoes called World 10. But it was very, very special because it really had no heel. Now you think of somebody running 26 miles and not landing on the heel. Uh. So he's what we call the floater, where we just land on the ball of the foot all the, all the time. And hardly wear a shoe, it's just so light. So this is no here, but we made the show and a lot of people bought it and a lot of people had real problems because they were, they were normal, like me and you, we'd, we'd land on our heel, yep. <laughs> we'd run clump clump, we'd do, the, we'd do the normal way of running and of course without any heel, that was a problem. So we always just say, are you sure you want a pair of World 10? But you know, Ron Hill came in, he also 
helps us develop what we, the shoe we call ten detector, because uh, most uh, shoes these days, most running shoes, sports, but they, they come up at the back of the heel. And, and that's what something we, we sort of designed that because that way you could pull the shoe up. And there also used to be a loose tab that you could use, but we've decided, but that up the back of the heel used to rub the heel and give the tendon some problem. So then we put a dip in the heel and that was called tend detector. So this is being very specific, very much in, but you know, that gives you credibility. Yep. So it gives you amazing credibility when you design something because there is something, there's a problem in there. This is not just making a shoe, this is making something work. And so, you know, we always look at how can we make something work better and better. And uh, so I, I didn't, I never thought it was a question of saying that, how do you challenge uh, Adidas or how do you challenge Nike? No, we will grow by our own design. <laughs> we will grow from our own efforts and uh, in order to beat them, and we did. By, by late 1980, we'd become number one sports brand. Yep. Globally. So uh, there's, a, there's a few uh, few lessons uh, to be learned there, I guess. And that's probably the reason why a windscreen's 40 times bigger than a rear vision mirror. If you're creating your own path, you've got a wider field to, to look ahead rather than reflecting what everybody else is doing. So in, interesting, uh, interesting thought process. So Joe, um, <laughs> I've been in some big companies myself, and uh, and from time to time you hear about some skullduggery and some things that are going on. I remember reading one time Bob Ansett, who's the son of uh, Reg in Australia, and uh, he started a car rental brand, and that's what the business I was in at the time. And he'd be ringing up uh, airline booking places and double booking and triple booking people and then getting his reps to turn up at the counter. And when the person they were overbooked, he'd uh, take the booking. Have you seen any... Uh, dirty tricks in uh, in the world of big business and uh, anything you can share or what are your philosophies on some of those tactics that most people perhaps would look on and think, hmm, uh, I don't, I'm not quite sure I'm, I'm with that. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that a, lot of, uh, a lot of those things went on. They probably went on at a different level than what I, I would pick up on. Um, and, and if ever, you know, it's a question of whether I looked on things as being more, oh, this is a challenge, uh, as against somebody doing a dirty trick to me and playing, you know, playing foul, as it were. Um, I never really experienced that type of, uh, that type of feeling in my, my time, it, because we, would, we got used to so many challenges. You know, every time a challenge came around, uh, and it may well be a bit of a dirty trick, we'll look at it and say, how can we turn that to our, our advantage? You know, what can we, how can we make that work for us? And that was our philosophy on any, any problem that we came up against. Look, look, if we've got a problem, the, there must be not only an answer, there must be a way that this can help us, where we can gain from it. So it was always sitting down with a smile on your face and saying, right guys, bit of a challenge here. Yeah, how can we help this? Um, dirty tricks. I mean, I can remember things like during the Olympics, um, athletes who, who were probably sponsored by Nike and w you had a Reebok sponsored event and then, you know, they would try and cover up the, uh, the Reebok because they had to wear Reebok uh, shirts and you know, people trying to cover those things up. I mean, I mean that's fairly natural, isn't it? That's it's sort of, you know, what you expect um, yeah. when you've got brands competing with each other in, in, in the same, well, on the same sort of arena at that time. Yeah. Joe, um, interesting. So Joe, uh, you've been around the block and back again uh, over your career. Um, and you must have dealt with unforeseen crisis and stuff that uh, like we're going through now globally with COVID, where I don't think we've probably you know, gone through too many of those before, but we had the global financial crisis uh, back in 2008. We've had property crashes. We've had Asian meltdowns back in the 90s. It seems that you know every decade or so there's something that's coming along that's that you have to deal with. How did you deal with crisis in 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 the company? You know something's really critical, and you have to move swiftly in order to manoeuvre the ship so that uh, you can steer your, your, yourself through that. What 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 would be a strategy that you would adopt? Well, you know, we've never. <laughs> I've been in the sports industry for a long, long time, and never had the same as COVID. COVID has stopped everything. COVID has put a clamp on it. 
um, because you know we used to go through recessions, all these many recessions. But you know, ever since I've been in the business, the sports trade has avoided recessions. The sports trade has been more, it's like entertainment. It, it's something that people are going to. We're getting more time. You know, people want to do more things, uh, and it's sport. It's, it's how, how do you uh, you know what what do you do when you've got this time? So you you, you do some sport, whatever it is. And I, I always found that going through all the recessions that, uh, that we went through in the UK, um, we just sailed through it. We, we didn't have that. Um, and so COVID though has been a, been a different thing. Um, and how do you handle crisis? Well, I think we more or less came upon that by, before by saying, well, you're looking at it as a problem because if it is a problem, it's how do you make the most of it? And a lot of people who've been in uh, with COVID <clears throat> A lot of people couldn't move, couldn't change, and they've gone down and they've really suffered with it. But a lot of people have changed. You know, online, <clears throat> we look now, COVID has probably brought online sales forward by 10 years. Yep. It, it, you know, it's done it. And, and it's brought the, the use of the computer, moving that on. We now have Zoom, we have everything. Now you, <clears throat> and, you know, clever people who can, who can use the technology have really used it. To boost it, I think only today we we went an online retailer who's who's just about doubled his business and, and made made millions because people have gone online. People have started to work on it and say this is better. So it's like like any crisis, it's a matter of looking at it and <clears throat> saying, look, there's a way around this, whichever whatever it is. Um, you know, when we changed our name, you might say that was a crisis. <laughs> We also had a, um, a moment when Adidas, well, their lawyer, sent us a letter because our silhouette was two, two bars and a T-bar. And Adidas is three bars. And the, the solicitor sent the letter and said, like, we're, we're, we're infringing the trademark, the, the trade design, in fact. And uh, we thought, no, we're not really. But, wow, Adidas have written to us. Yeah. <laughs> this is a plus. Fantastic. Yeah, we don't say they're worried about us, but they recognize us, we're there. So the easy way around that was, well, what should we do? So we changed our silhouette. We changed it to the vector, which is, you know, and, and I think again, that's been for the good. Yep. When we changed it, it's more distinctive that than, than having two bars and a T-bar. Yep. So, you know, this is crisis. When things come along and try to change, our, uh, I had a distributor, a, a good friend of, of mine, he was uh, the head of uh, sales for, for quite a big uh, football boot company. And um, he did, he, he asked me, could we be a distributor? Because they didn't do trainers, training shoes. Or, I said, yes, why not? We got a nice piece of agreement. 18 months later, he left the company because the man who ran the company, who we respected tremendously, retired, brought in his son-in-law, son-in-law changed things, didn't work, Shaq moved off, went to Barter. Well, and about 18 months after he had left, the company went bust. It's, yep. it's, it's a longish story with all sorts of complications. But they owed us a lot of money. They had a lot of our shoes in stock. So I just hired a van, went down and I collected these thousands of shoes, brought them back, and we're looking at each other. We had to lay off a lot of people yeah. in, in the factory. I said, look, guys, we've just got to cut our production there now. And all those people, they, some wanted to just keep working for nothing. <laughs> I was amazed. Yeah. Others said, can we come back when, you, when you've got this over? Yes, you can come back. And we did eventually take everybody back. We, I think within six months, we were back on with everybody back. But during those six months, we took those shoes and we went to schools, we went to everywhere where we could sell them, and we sold all those shoes. And, you know, we made more money. <laughs> yeah. Than, than we're making through the wholesaler. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah. again, I turned adversity into your advantage. So that... That's also about timing too, Joe, and you talk in your book about timing and the importance of timing. Can you just uh, share some thoughts uh, on that? Because I think that, it, that applies to a lot of business people and they don't quite realise it. Well, I think the timing also is to do with your business. And I was looking at our business and we were, we were in athletics, nice business in the UK. Yes, I had lots of people, lots of agents and we're selling our product. But um, it was a small market compared to football. This was a small market and Adidas has got football pretty well wrapped up. We didn't have the money to, uh, uh, to, to challenge them on that market. 
the only way to do it would be pay a lot of money to, to do that. And so we, we couldn't charge them. But uh, Foster's, uh, during their time, they had an agreement with Yale University and they were selling 200 pounds a month to Yale University. And Yale University obviously was selling them out to other universities. So I'm thinking, I need America. I've got to go to America. Every college, every university has coach. Coach is like God. And, and you, can go, you can go to college and get a... Uh, <sighs> You can get this, you, know, you, get, you can earn yourself a place at college with a sports scholarship. Yep. You can do that. You know, that's it. You must go to America. At the same time, I'm thinking that I'm reading in a magazine that the British government would like to see the sports industry export in. And what we're, what we're going to do is uh, we, we'll invite you to take a stand at the NSGA show, which is National Sporting Goods of America uh, in Chicago. We invite you to take a stand, we'll pay for it. We'll pay for your return air fares and we'll pay for half of your, your expenses whilst you're out there, including hotel bills. Cheaper than staying at home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta do this. So I started, I went out there and uh, okay, and, and a lot of people coming up, like your product, like your shoes, yes, where do we get them from? And I'm saying, England. And they're looking at me and say, is that New England? You know, no, it's England, it's across the water. No, the Americans don't like importation. No, and they, it was, you know, they ended up by saying, well, look, when you get somebody over here where well, we've got nice stock and contact us and, you know, we, we'd love to try your product. Okay. 1968. Took me till 1979 to actually get a distributor. In between, I had about six failed attempts. Six different people we put on, tried to. One was even called Jimmy Carter, believe it or not. <laughs> um, <laughs> not the president, man. Right. But, but we... Tried this and failed. But during that, in 1968, uh, Runner's World was a one sheet magazine, if you call it a magazine, it was one sheet. But running during the 70s, running just bloomed into something massive. And by 1975, Runner's World was a full glossy magazine. And Bob Anderson, who published it, he, he, he was convincing everybody what shoes they should wear. And in fact, he, he brought out this idea that this is the number one shoe this year. I think it was probably Nike Tailwind. Well, Phil Knight is importing these things from Japan, from Onitsuka, which is now Asics. And could he, could he get, could he fit the demand? The demand immediately wants your number one by Bob. A million, there's an order for millions coming. Could he get millions of shoes? No. It took months and months. By the time he get, gets the product, by the time he gets it to the retailers who are clamoring for this shoe, there's another, there's another number one shoe due to come out. Yep. Well, that only happened twice. Uh, and I think somebody had a word with Bob Anderson and said, look, Bob, you're killing us. You can't do this. You know, you've got to do something different. So Bob Anderson changed this to star ratings. Five star would be the best. Well, then you could have three or four shoes. That was it. Time moved by. I knew, yep. I, I knew I could build a five-star shoe. I knew yep. that. That's what it is. So uh, from that moment on, it was designing Aztec. Designed Aztec. In 1978, we went to Edmonton to the Commonwealth Games with, with a full, uh, it was the, called, they called it the gold range. It was Aztec was the trainer, Midas was a racer, and Inca was a spike. And we picked up medals, a lot of them gold. By 1979, February, Chicago, NSGA show, we had the shoe. Uh, at that time, running was becoming so big that there were not enough running shoe manufacturers to satisfy the demand. And um, you know, I had uh, Kmart. Kmart, they're big wholesalers in America, big warehouse. And they wanted 25,000 pairs. Well, our little factory could, that takes six months for our little factory doing nothing else. But you know, going for the five star, we knew two things. One is, we needed to go somewhere else for production. And Barter, my friend who had uh, left his distributor that nearly killed me, he got out of, He said, look, we'll make your shoes. Fine, great. But then came out and wanted a better price. Ah, uh, yes, well, by the, in those days, production was starting to go to the Far East. And at Far East, they could make it less than half the price and it looked beautiful. So we'd already been talking with, uh, with South Korea. Brilliant, so I, I could answer that. But along came Paul Fireman. Paul Feynman, he was um, an outdoor wholesaler, tents, fishing rods, you name it, in Boston. And he, it was called Boston Camping. And he said, Joe, he said, uh, 
I'd love to be your distributor. I said, but we've got to have a five-star shoe. Paul, Paul, come on, look at this. This is a five-star shoe. This is it. Ah, Paul said, yeah, okay. But is it a five-star shoe or will it be a five-star shoe? I said, it will be a five-star shoe. Don't, don't. Die. Ah, I said, I'd love to go now. He said, but look, Joe, if you get a five-star shoe, I'm your man. February 1979. It's the last week in July when the shoe edition is out. And I went across to America and spent some time talking to Paul, going having a look at his Boston camping operation. Great. And I like Paul better than thinking of going to Kmart. Kmart really just sold square footage. And if you didn't make enough money on that square footage, you, that would be your last first and last order. So uh, with Paul, you know, anyway, along the, the last week in July, I phoned Paul. I got him out of bed, I think, in fact, because it was midday for us, but it was very early in the morning for Paul. Yep. Uh, about seven o'clock, yeah. And uh, anyway, he came back an hour later. He'd got a magazine. He said, Job, I stay with five stars. Wow. That was it. We'd hit the jackpot. We'd got the hook. We're, yep. we, we would be in America. We were going to have orders. He said, but John, not only Aztec, he said, Midas and Inca in their own categories, they also got five stars. So we went to America with three five stars. Now, that's timing. <laughs> yeah. If running hadn't been growing, you know, all these things, if runner's world hadn't been there, it was at that time. Brilliant. And then once we got there, the other bit of timing is dropping onto aerobics. Yep. Yeah. I mean, that we were doing nicely in, uh, in London, but aerobics just shot us through the, uh, through the roof. Yep. No, it's, uh, it, it's, uh, you, you seem to be a guy that uh, seems to make his own luck, uh, running through some of those uh, scenarios. You're getting, putting yourself in the right place often enough. It's amazing how, uh, how that all happens. And I know, you know, you've got a pretty strong uh, idea with uh, developing connections and they're important to develop uh, great connections. Today, we've got things like LinkedIn and what everything's online, but uh, how do you develop a, a great uh, connection? And, you know, maybe not for now, but for some point in the future, did you have any strategy back then or is it, Purely, you just like developing connections. I think that, uh, you know, if you're decent people doing decent things with lots of integrity, you meet other people who are decent people who also have lots of integrity and you share something, you share a passion. Uh, it was football for, for me and sport as well. So I had people that you meet these people, you go around to sports shows, you go around to events and you bump into, oh, he's working for Adidas. Oh, he's working for Sonic. How are these things going on? Yeah. And at that level, <clears throat> it's great. I remember uh, bumping into Jeff Johnson, who was really the right-hand man of uh, Phil Knight. Right? <clears throat> he came up with Nike. He came up with the swoosh. You know, he was a thinking man. He was a, and, and it was great. We got on great. In fact, there were still blue ribbon sports at that time when I, when I bumped into him. Uh, Phil Knight wasn't at the shore. If he was, he certainly wasn't near the stand. And so you, you get to know people. <clears throat> and uh, it was the same with uh, John Willie Johnson when we were just growing and we needed machinery. And, you know, he, we, we met at auctions because in, in those days, all the footwear industry in the UK was closing down <clears throat> because they couldn't compete. So there were lots of auctions used to go to. And, uh, and John Willie, he, he, he knew, you know, we, we met each other. We, we come had a conversation. He knew I was from Perry. He was from just up the valley, which was a... Um, 20 miles away, that's all. And, and he suggested that instead of when we go to the sales going individually, why don't we go together, like, you know? And I, I, I offered to drive him, but I think, he, I think he knew the car I was driving at the time. So, so he said, no, 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 I'll drive. <laughs> he said, well, you come along, park your car up and we'll go in my car. And because I used to, he used to, at these auctions, he, he never used to buy anything. He always used to sit there and the auctioneer used to try and sell whatever, whatever. If something didn't sell, he'd just look at John and John would just give a nod. And, and so everything that didn't sell, John would buy it, everything. And so I, I said, uh, where do you put all this stuff, John? He said, next time we go, come early. And so I went up one hour early and he took me into his warehouse. Stuff, birds, stuff, crocodiles, you name it, he'd eat everything. But I did see a nice machine that we needed one of those. And I asked John, I said, John, can I buy this machine? He said, no. I said, well, can I rent it? I said, no. 
So, okay, John. He said, you can have it. He said, you can have it, and when you're done with it, give it me back. Yep. <laughs> you know, where do you get that? Yeah. Yeah. And not only that, he actually got his men to bring the machine and put it in the, into our uh, our little factory and connect it up. You know, he did just uh, didn't want paying for that. No. Yep. You know, these are the friendships you by going to the different businesses, different. We used to go to trade shows. I used to go to all the trade shows. So you'd meet the people who got the same challenges you had, and when you meet the right people, you've got a nice friendship. Yep. It's uh, it's probably something that's going to be lost in time to come, where we move more online and and uh, you know where people are having text message conversations and whatnot. The old good old days of actually pressing the flesh is uh, uh, perhaps behind us as uh, uh, compared to what it could be in the future. But Joe, you might, you you know you through your life you must have met a variety and a plethora of different interesting types of people from all walks of life. Does anybody stand out as someone that you said, hmm, there's someone I admire or there's someone that was really interesting and uh, what, what made them that way? <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm not finished my journey yet. <laughs> so maybe there's more, you never know. But the answer to that is really difficult. Um, you know, we, I mean, we didn't just sort of entertain athletes. We, we got into Hollywood and, you know, that was big. I mean, you know, we made and we met royalty, royalty in the UK and royalty in, in, Mon in Monaco. He even went, was invited into the palace there to meet up with uh, Grimaldi and share a glass of champagne. Um, but, you know, of all these people, and, and it was one, one person in particular is John Forsyth. I don't know if you remember John Forsyth. He was Blake Carrington in, in Dynasty. Yep. And... Uh, we're in Monte Carlo. We're having a Princess Grace Memorial dinner in the big in the <clears throat> Hotel de Paris. There's hundreds of people in there, All, either leading CEOs or even owners of big businesses. And you know, it, it's a place like you think, oops, you know, like, <laughs> okay, this is great. And I'd only met John for sight once, and he came across the room, just kind of shook and said, "Hi, Joe. Nice to meet you again." And I'm done for a bit. Yeah. What's this? What's this? And so I said, John, hey, it's nice to meet you again. I said, how do you remember my name? We want to met once. And he said, Joe, that's my business. <laughs> and absolutely great. But but he would always come, we would always have a conversation. You know, he would say, Look, Joe. He said, it's taken me till now to become a heartthrob. He said, at 70, at 70, I'm a heartthrob. I said, okay, John, but at least you made it. <laughs> I'm not too sure I'd be a heartthrob, but <laughs> so, you know, and they become real friends. And uh, yeah, I mean, I went round Wendell Niles. He was a big empresario in Hollywood and he knew all the people. He got Frank Sinatra to our place. He got uh, Sean Connery and Roger Moore. Yeah, and, you know, these people were all coming. Um, and, and he took me around Hollywood and he, he took me to different houses and, and whatever. So you, you meet a lot of people, but I say the one that stands out is, uh, is John Forsyth, is a real, real, real trooper, real nice man. He used to come over when we were having events and he'd go on television. You know, the, the inter early in the morning, he'd go on and he'd talk up the, the brand. So, you know, yeah, lots of them. But uh, like I say, it's my job. <laughs> it, it's uh, very interesting. Joe, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you as part of the show today and uh, some of your stories fantastic we could keep this going for hours but anybody that wants to have a little look and and uh, uh, get the interesting behind the scenes story this is a great read I got it there a month or so ago and uh, it uh, it just uh, allows everybody to have another little look so the shoemaker by uh, our host here Joe Foster interesting read Joe, thank you uh, very much for being part of the show today. We really appreciate your time and wish you well. And I look forward to uh, catching up for uh, another edition uh, as we move through. So, uh, Joe Foster, thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.